Hello, everyone. Welcome to the China Brief. We bring you the latest global media coverage on China's current affairs, economy, and society, as well as exclusive analysis. Our trustworthy, professional, and multi-perspective China reporting provides judgment and decision-making references for the world's elites. The China Brief is issued in multiple languages, including text, video, podcasts, and books, and is broadcasted 24/7 in the six-degree world. We bring you the latest content on China's current affairs, economy, and society from the global media, as well as exclusive analysis. China Briefing is published in multiple languages. Please subscribe through sixdobrief.com. China's local government debt crisis nears tipping point. Should Beijing provide help? The South China Morning Post reports that China's local government debt crisis is approaching a tipping point. With growing concerns about the risk of default by city and county governments and questions about whether Beijing is willing to provide enough support to avoid a collapse, last week Kunming, the capital of southwestern China's Yunnan province, denied online reports that its local government financing platforms (LGFVs) were having trouble repaying their debts, and that one of them had raised an impromptu two billion yuan (282 million dollars). On May 21, to make repayments, LGFVs are set up to support off-budget financing, particularly for infrastructure spending. But inadequate disclosure requirements have led to concerns about hidden debt risks. A government think tank in Sichuan Province warned in April that Guizhou, a neighboring province in Yunnan, could not cope with its debt problems on its own and needed help from the central government. The report was subsequently removed by the review. Beijing has stepped up regulation of local government debt over the past few years in an attempt to curb the risk, saying local governments should not expect a state bailout. But Yu Yongding, a leading economist and former central bank advisor, said it was wrong for the central government to rely on local governments to solve its debt problems. Local governments are the children of the central government, and the central government must also take some responsibility. You wrote in a May 4 blog post published by the Economics 50 Forum, a Chinese think tank. It is important that solving the local government debt problem should not lead to a further decline in economic growth. Of course, moral hazard should not be encouraged. Those responsible for directly causing the deterioration of local debt should also be held accountable. Yu Yongding estimates that the central government's contribution to infrastructure spending is only about 0.1 percent, while the LGFV's contribution is closer to 60 percent, and they bear a much higher cost of borrowing. The ratio of local debt to gross domestic product (GDP) in many provinces is already too high," said Hu Jia, a former senior economist at the Federal Reserve's Atlanta branch and now a professor at Shanghai Jiaodong University. In an interview with Shanghai News Site Observer late last month, who said that too rapid deleveraging could lead to a series of defaults, but the central government can't stay away when local governments have problems that can't be cleaned up, who said. There are no official data on local governments' off-balance sheet debt, but most estimates show the size of that debt is growing. The International Monetary Fund (IMF). Estimated in a February report that China's total LGFV debt has reached a record 66 trillion renminbi this year, more than double the 30.7 trillion renminbi in 2017. Estimates by French investment bank Nadexis put China's public debt to GDP ratio at 95% in the fourth quarter of 2022, down from 120% in the U.S. and 92% in the eurozone. But Nadexis acknowledges that the estimates have limitations because they rely on publicly disclosed data, some of which is not readily available. China's move to increase infrastructure spending to support the economy has raised questions about the sustainability of local government debt. Many local governments have seen revenues decline, real estate markets weaken, and financing costs rise. This is unsustainable. Li Daokui, director of Tsinghua University's Academic Center for China Economic Practice and Thinking and a former advisor to the People's Bank of China, said at a forum arranged by the university last month that the central government should shoulder part of the local government debt burden. 
Relying only on local finances and the profits of local state-owned enterprises is not enough to cover the cost of interest repayment, let alone principal repayment. This is unsustainable, Li Daokue said. Our institute suggests that future debt issuance must go through certain procedures. At the same time, a significant portion of local debt should be transferred to the central government. Analysts say investor confidence will suffer if there is no long-term solution to China's debt crisis. Minxing Securities said late last month that most of Kunming's LGFVs have lost access to capital markets since the beginning of this year, relying mainly on local government funding. Perhaps the market believes the probability of eventual repayment remains high, but these small twists and turns in the process will further increase local pressure and could create a negative cycle, the firm said. Going forward, if you want to restore capital market acceptance and issue bonds in the market again, you can imagine the difficulties will increase. Here is the China briefing. Sullivan says Biden will meet Xi Jinping at some point. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said Sunday that President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping will meet, at some point, as tensions between the two countries continue to rise, The Hill reported. In an interview on CNN's Fareed Zakaria GPS, host Fareed Zakaria asked Sullivan if he agreed with former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger's comments in a recent interview with The Economist, in which Kissinger said the U.S.-China relationship is in a classic pre-World War I situation, and neither side knows that they have any political space to make any concessions on this issue. Sullivan told Zakaria, I sat in the same room where President Biden and President Xi Jinping met in Bali last year, and my experience was not like that. He added that the two world leaders tried to reach an understanding. Sullivan also told Zakaria that he had just met with Wang Yi, head of China's Foreign Affairs Committee office, where the two diplomats discussed all strategic issues in their ongoing relationship and expressed hope that dialogue between the two countries would continue in the coming months. Then, at some point, we will see President Biden and President Xi Jinping meet again, Sullivan said. So it seems to me that it's perfectly consistent to have intense competition in important areas like economics and technology, but also to make sure that that competition doesn't turn into conflict or confrontation. That's President Biden's strong belief. It's his way of managing this relationship responsibly. We believe that some kind of conflict or cold war between the United States and China is not inevitable. Tensions between the U.S. and China have escalated over the years. Earlier this year, U.S. officials expressed concern about China's deadly assistance to Russia in its ongoing war with Ukraine. Here is the China briefing. Security threat from Chinese drones, U.S. states take action. The Capitol Hill reports that Arkansas has become the latest state to ban the use of Chinese drones by state and local agencies after responding to concerns about cybersecurity. The state joins Florida, Mississippi and Tennessee, which passed bills restricting the use of Chinese-made drones by government agencies in previous actions. This follows similar actions by the U.S. Department of Defense and other federal agencies. While some actions cover all Chinese drone manufacturers, many are focused on one company, DJI, DJI. Since its founding in 2006, DJI has grown to control 70% of the global commercial drone market. Despite years of denials, the company has received investments from the Chinese Communist Party. This close connection has led to DJI's drones being used to spy on Uyghurs in Xinjiang. The company also sabotaged Ukraine's drone detection software during Russia's war against Ukraine, while retaining Russian capabilities. Despite these abuses, U.S. federal, state and local governments continue to rely heavily on DJI drones. Almost 90% of the drones used by police and emergency services come from DJI innovations. Similarly, my review of drone purchases by state forestry, transportation and wildlife agencies found that approximately 80% of drones come from DJI innovations. Concerns about DJI's misuse overseas are now being combined with concerns about domestic surveillance. 
There is growing concern in the U.S. national security community that DJI Innovations drones may be sending proprietary information back to China for access by the Chinese Communist Party. This is a legitimate concern, given the Chinese Communist Party's history of requiring technical equipment to install backdoors, which would allow the Chinese Communist Party to access data collected by the equipment on critical infrastructure and U.S. agency operations, posing a national security threat. Given this danger, the federal government has taken steps to protect the nation from potential cybersecurity abuses by DJI Innovations and other Chinese drone manufacturers. In 2017, the U.S. Army required its troops to stop using DJI Innovations drones because they were aware of cybersecurity vulnerabilities with these drones. The National Defense Authorization Act of 2020 took more aggressive action by prohibiting the use of federal funds in the Department of Defense to purchase Chinese drones. Other federal agencies, including the Department of the Interior, have grounded Chinese-made drones due to similar concerns. In March, a cross-party group of senators asked the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency to evaluate the cybersecurity of DJI Innovation drones. Just last month, the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee passed the Secure America Drone Act, which would ban the federal government from purchasing Chinese drones. Now, lawmakers in various states are following their lead. In addition to the four states mentioned above, blue states such as California, Hawaii and Washington, and red states such as Texas and Alabama are taking steps to ban the use of Chinese-made drones by state and local government agencies. These bans vary in several ways, including which government department enforces them and how quickly they take effect. Texas, for example, implemented the ban immediately through the governor's office, with no advance notice. Meanwhile, Florida immediately banned the use of state funds to purchase Chinese drones and established a quick timeline for when state agencies could no longer use Chinese drones. Other states, such as Mississippi and Arkansas, have set multi-year plans to phase out agency use of Chinese drones. A more detailed review of these state-level legislative and administrative actions suggests that these initiatives will improve safety, but more work remains to be done. First, some bans, such as the one in Texas, are too narrowly focused on DJI innovations. Such bans still allow state and local government agencies to purchase drones from other Chinese manufacturers, such as Autel and Yunnik. Similar to DJI innovation, these companies may have similar cybersecurity vulnerabilities, so the ban should cover all Chinese-made drones. Second, these laws should be expanded to cover government contractors. While Florida, Arkansas, and Mississippi laws already prohibit contractors working with state and local agencies from using Chinese-made drones, Tennessee has no such provision. If a state does not want agencies to use Chinese-made drones, why should contractors be allowed to use them for the same tasks? Finally, to ensure that these bans are not financially burdensome and potentially challenged as unfunded mandate requests, states should use federal grant programs to develop funding programs to replace Chinese drones. For example, state police departments could apply for grants from the Department of Homeland Security that these departments have used to purchase drones in the past. Similarly, State transportation departments could apply for DOT smart program grants, state forestry departments could apply for matching grants through the U.S. Forest Service, and wildlife departments could apply for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's state wildlife grant program. Developing a funding plan, as Florida has done, would also ensure that drone bans are not challenged and potentially revoked due to lack of funding. It is encouraging that state and local policymakers recognize the cybersecurity threat posed by Chinese drones. But to achieve better results, federal and state bans must comprehensively cover all relevant areas. Here's the China briefing. Dozens detained in Hong Kong as Beijing cracks down on June 4 anniversary. Canada's CBC reports that Hong Kong police conducted a massive search and detention operation on Sunday including four arrests for seditious intent, as authorities tightened security measures for the 34th anniversary of the 1989 Tiananmen Square crackdown. 
Hong Kong's restrictions have stifled what was once the largest commemoration of the Chinese military's bloody crackdown on pro-democracy demonstrators. Today, cities such as Taipei, London, New York and Berlin continue to keep the memory of June 4 alive. Near Victoria Park, where the annual commemoration was once held, hundreds of police officers conducted a stop-and-search operation and deployed armored vehicles and police cars. Witnesses for Reuters saw more than a dozen people being removed, including activist Alexandra Wong, 67, with a bouquet of flowers, a man holding a copy of the play, 35th of May, and an elderly man standing alone on a street corner lighting candles. Chris Tu, 51, said, The regime wants you to forget, but you can't forget. It, China, wants to falsify all history. He arrived at the park wearing a black t-shirt and was searched by police. He said, we need to use our bodies and our words to tell others what is happening. Hong Kong activists say the police action is part of a broader campaign by China to crack down on dissent in Hong Kong, which Britain promised 50 years of continued freedom under the one country, two systems model when it handed Hong Kong back to China in 1997. Security measures in Hong Kong have been significantly stepped up this year, with local media reporting the deployment of as many as 6,000 police officers, including riot and counterterrorism officers. Senior officials warned people to obey the law, but declined to say definitively whether such commemorations would be illegal under a national security law that China imposed on Hong Kong in 2020. The law was imposed in the wake of sometimes volatile mass pro-democracy protests. Police said in a statement that some people were arrested for seditious intent and disturbing public order. The Canadian Consulate General in Hong Kong marked the event with a statement saying, Canada stands with those who have been prevented from exercising their right to protest. In Beijing, Tiananmen Square was crowded with tourists taking pictures under the watchful eye of police and others, but there were no visible signs of increased security. A group of relatives called the Tiananmen Mothers said the suffering has never stopped. In a statement released by New York-based Human Rights Watch, the group said, even though 34 years have passed, for those of us who lost family members, the pain of losing a loved one that night still haunts us today. Despite warnings in Hong Kong, some people, including bookstore owners, secretly commemorate June 4. In mainland China, any reference to the Tiananmen Square crackdown is taboo, and the topic is heavily censored. Responding to a question in Beijing about events around the world commemorating the event, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Mao Ning said the government had drawn a clear conclusion about the political unrest of the late 1980s. Zhou Hengdong is one of the imprisoned activists in Hong Kong and the leader of a group called the June 4 Gala. She said on Facebook that she would go on a 34-hour hunger strike. In democratically governed Taiwan, the only place in the Chinese-speaking world where the event is freely commemorated, hundreds of people attended a commemoration at Taipei's Freedom Square, where a sculpture of a pillar of shame was on display. Field interpreter Peggy Kwan, 57, expressed sadness at the restrictions on commemorations in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is going backwards, she said. China claims Taiwan as part of its territory and has not renounced its right to use force to ensure eventual reunification. Taiwan Vice President Lai ching tae also a presidential candidate for the ruling Democratic Progressive Party next January, wrote that the memory of the 1989 events in Beijing must be preserved. Here's the China briefing. Chinese warship approaches U.S. destroyer, just 137 meters away. Nikkei Asia reports that a Chinese warship approached a U.S. destroyer in the Taiwan Strait in an unsafe manner at a distance of just 150 yards, 137 meters, a U.S. military official said. Meanwhile, China accused the U.S. of deliberately provoking risk in the area. The U.S. and Canadian navies conducted joint exercises on Saturday in the Taiwan Strait, which separates the island of Taiwan from China. The U.S. Indo-Pacific Command said in a statement that the Chinese vessel forced the USS Chunghoon, a guided missile destroyer, to slow down to avoid a collision when it suddenly sailed ahead of the ship. 
The People's Republic of China has claimed Taiwan as its territory since the establishment of a defeated government that fled to Taiwan after the Communist Party of China defeated the Republic of China government in a civil war in 1949. Taiwan's government says the People's Republic of China has never ruled the island, and U.S. President Joe Biden has said the United States would defend Taiwan in the event of a Chinese invasion. China's military condemned a rare joint U.S.-Canada voyage in the sensitive Taiwan Strait, calling it a deliberate provocation of risk. The U.S. Indo-Pacific Command said the Chunyun and Canada's USS Montreal were on a routine cruise in the strait when the Chinese vessel suddenly sailed ahead of the U.S. ship. U.S. Indo-Pacific Command said the Chinese vessel's closest point of contact was 150 yards and its actions violated maritime traffic rules for safe passage in international waters. Video footage shown on the Canadian website Global News shows the close contact between the ships. The Chinese embassy in Washington did not immediately respond to a request for comment. The maritime encounter was the latest close encounter between the U.S. and Chinese militaries, with a Chinese fighter jet conducting unnecessarily provocative actions against a U.S. military aircraft in international airspace in the South China Sea on May 26, the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command said Tuesday. Liu Pengyu, a spokesman for the Chinese embassy in Washington, did not comment on specific details of the fighter jet incident, but said the U.S. routinely deploys aircraft and ships to conduct close reconnaissance of China, which poses a serious threat to China's national security. White House National Security Advisor Jack Sullivan said in a pre-recorded CNN interview broadcast Sunday that the U.S. seeks to maintain stable cross-strait relations between China and Taiwan and avoid a conflict that would lead to a global economic meltdown. The interview was conducted on CNN's Farid Zakaria GPS on Friday. Chinese Defense Minister Li Shangfu told Asia's top security summit on Sunday that a conflict with the United States would be an unbearable disaster, but that China seeks dialogue rather than confrontation. Get the latest news, analysis and policy briefings on China-related issues from around the world with China Briefing. The Six Degrees team compiles, synthesizes and summarizes the most important information from a variety of sources, including media, think tanks, government agencies, and industry experts. Our mission is to provide you with easy-to-access and highly valuable information that is tailored to your specific area of interest. We understand the importance of keeping abreast of the latest developments related to China and aim to make this information accessible to our readers. Please subscribe to the China Brief through 6dobrief.com and you can receive the China Brief by email from anywhere in the world.